Would you join me for a word of prayer today? Loving God, open our hearts and minds to hear these words of Scripture. Challenge us, push us, stretch us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're in this summer series called Jesus vs. Religion. And we're looking at the fact that when you study the Gospels, it becomes abundantly clear that Jesus had some issues with organized religion of his day. And he called out the religious leaders on a regular basis. He challenged their conventional wisdom. Uh, He came to hold religion accountable. And we've said that there is a difference between just being a Christian and actually being a disciple, being a follower of Jesus. Last Sunday, I ended the sermon with the two-question final exam that Jesus gives to all of us, and we have our whole lives to prepare for it. Two questions. Do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Second question. Do you love your neighbor as yourself? He said... On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Today I want to talk about what I see as one of the greatest challenges for religion in general and for Christianity. And it's a topic that Jesus addressed quite often in the scriptures, and that is the topic of judgment. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Do not judge, so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Then he raises a profound question, perhaps one of the most profound questions that we could wrestle with in our lives. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but fail to recognize the log in your own eye? First... Take the log out of your own eye, and then you can see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Anybody's car alarm? They want to get that? (laughs) We have a natural tendency to look for what is wrong with everybody else, before taking an honest look in the mirror to see what needs fixing in our own lives. It's much easier to point to the shortcomings of other people than to acknowledge our own character flaws. We naturally want to blame our problems on others so that we don't ever have to deal with the true source of many of our problems, ourselves, the things that lie within. I remember Will Kime used to say, when you point one finger at somebody else, you've got three fingers pointing back to the main source of most of your problems. If you ask people who are not in the church or who have left the church the problem that they have with Christians, they will often say hypocrisy and judgment People saying that Christians believe one thing, but they do another. Or they say that Christians just tend to judge people as though they are better than everybody else. A few years ago, there was a survey done by Tom Rainier, who is the head of Lifeway Research, based right here in Nashville. And uh, for over a decade, Rainier has been researching unchurched and de-churched people to find out how they feel about the church, how they feel about Christianity. And the the results of that survey were very fascinating. Contrary to popular belief, Rainier says that non-Christians are not turned off by the church or by preaching or by Sunday school or even by evangelism. But there were some other things that bothered them about the Christian community. It included Christians who treat other Christians poorly. The unchurched don't expect Christians to be perfect, but they can't understand why we treat each other without dignity and respect. Non-Christians are bothered by holier-than-thou attitudes. 
The unchurched know that Christians will make mistakes, but they have uh, a problem understanding why Christians aren't more forgiving. And they understand when people mess up, but they are repulsed when Christians act superior to them. Something else they found. Non-Christians are bothered by Christians who talk more than they listen. Many of the unchurched at some point have a perception that a Christian is somebody who can offer a sympathetic and listening ear. But unfortunately, many of the unchurched thought that Christians were just too busy to take the time to listen to them. You ever heard that saying? We have two ears and one mouth for a reason. Lastly, Rainier said that non-Christians are bothered by Christians who don't go to church or who very rarely attend church. They saw a major disconnect between belief and practice. Um, It bothered them that Christians said the church is so important, but they were rarely there. Rainier concluded his research with these words. They're all aware that any human being will stumble at times, but these unchurched individuals want to know that Christians will treat each other well, and they want to see humility in our lives. They want to know that we will take the time to listen and even take more time to really be involved in their lives. And they want to know that we love our churches and that we are committed to supporting our churches. There was another book that came out almost 10 years ago that was the result of some research done by a couple guys named David Kinneman and Gabe Lyons. And the book was was titled Unchristian, What a New Generation Really Thinks About Christianity and Why It Matters. And this book was actually focused on the younger generations trying to understand how they view Christianity and how they view the church. And in that book, there were six themes that they were able to point to after talking to the younger generations, the millennials, the mosaics, whatever you want to call that generation. The first theme was they said that they thought lots of Christians were hypocritical, saying one thing, doing another. The second theme was that they were too focused on just getting converts. Outsiders wonder if we genuinely care about them or if we just want to convert them. The third theme, the younger generation said that Christians were homophobic. They say that Christians show disdain for gays and lesbians and treat them very, very poorly. The fourth theme is that Christians were sheltered. Many Christians are out of touch with reality and they live in an ideological bubble. The fifth theme, Christians are too political. Christians are overly motivated by a political agenda, and they often use the faith to accomplish that agenda. And the sixth theme was that they are judgmental. The younger generations say that Christians are quick to judge them, bringing into question Jesus' ethic of unconditional love. These were the themes that they discovered in talking to the younger generations, and they backed this up with significant research and significant data. Now here's where things get complicated when it comes to this subject of judgment. If you look up the word judgment in the dictionary or somewhere else, it's defined two different ways. One definition is the process of forming an opinion or evaluation by discerning and comparing. We respect people who are good judges of character. We teach our children to exercise good judgment as they live their lives because it will serve them well. We all make judgment calls on a regular basis. It's just part of living. It's part of surviving. It's part of being a human being. But another definition of judgment is the final judging of humankind by God. And it's this second definition of judgment that Jesus reminds us should only be reserved for God. And not for us. The first definition of judgment is a part of who we are. Discerning and analyzing, comparing, reacting. It's how we function. If somebody's walking towards us with a knife and they're going to do something to us, we make a judgment call and we react. If somebody only wants to be our friend because of what they can get out of us, then we make a judgment call as to whether we want to be that person's friend. If somebody is not telling us the truth. We make a judgment call as to whether we're going to trust that person in the future. If somebody is mean-spirited and unkind, we make a judgment call as to whether we want to spend time around that person. 
But what we don't need to do when it comes to religion and faith is try to play the role of God in determining the eternal fate of other people. There are many religious leaders and people in our day and age that try to do that, and there's really no need for it. Jesus reminds us that only God can judge. And to be honest with you, I don't know how you feel, but I'm thankful that I can leave the judgment up to God because God will do a better job than I will. I think God can handle it. If somebody asks me if I am uh, saved and if I'm going to go to heaven one day when I die, I tell them that I think I'm saved. I have every assurance of believing that I'm saved. But ultimately, I say I think that that's God's decision and not mine. And I'm okay with that. Eternal judgment by human beings is unnecessary, and it does a lot of damage. You know, some people who grew up in very strict, judgmental, rigid, uh, fundamentalist types of faith can become so damaged that they don't ever recover, that they never go back to the church. They'll turn away from God, they'll turn away from Christ, and they'll say, I don't want anything to do with that. And the church, which should be there for people during some of their most difficult times of life, is often guilty of kicking people when they're down through judgment. What's the difference between what often happens in the church and what happens in South Hall on a Tuesday or Thursday night in our AA group or Saturday morning in our Al-Anon group? There's not judgment in those meetings. People come for support. They come because they've either hit bottom, they've come because they don't want to be alone. And it's powerful. It's no secret. It's no secret that churches like to fight over social issues. It always has. You will find Christians on both sides of just about any hot topic. And so we've always tried to be honest at Woodmont. We've tried to be transparent in saying that we don't all agree when it comes to a whole list of of hot topics. We just don't. We don't want to pretend like we do. But the problem, at least as I see it, is not that Christians disagree over things like abortion and the death penalty and euthanasia and just war and homosexuality and same-sex marriage and the list goes on. That's always been the case. The problem is the way people act in order to defend their position. Because what happens is, regardless of which side you were on, given any particular issue, the anxiety and the fear that is produced when you try to defend your position causes you to act in an unchristian way, and that's where the problem lies. We stop treating each other with respect. We stop listening We forget all the areas where we do agree. And Christians that let the issues divide them, they trump the relationships that have been formed. And that's the problem. You see, when Christians lose the ability to have civil and respectful dialogue with each other, that becomes a problem. When Christians avoid each other because they don't agree with each other, that becomes a problem. We find a fascinating story in John's gospel, chapter 8. Jesus is at the temple. He's teaching. And the scribes and the Pharisees bring a woman to Jesus who has been caught in the act of adultery. And they're going to test Jesus like they often did. They say the law of Moses says that this woman should be stoned. How does Jesus respond? Brilliantly. He says, okay, then let's stone her. But um, I want the first person, the only people here who are without sin, you throw the first stone. If you don't have any sin in your life, then you throw the first stone. And what happens? Everybody drops their stone and they walk away. Then Jesus asks the woman, has no one condemned you? And she says, no, no one, sir. He says, neither have I condemned you. Go and sin no more. 
Rubel Shelley talks about this text in the book that I've recommended to you this summer. I knew Jesus before he was a Christian. He says, the sad plight of a woman caught in adultery turns into a beautiful story about compassion and the opportunity for a new beginning. This text informs me that I am not playing fast and loose with the Bible to tell someone who has committed sin that he can still be forgiven. I can tell somebody who has committed an embarrassing and well-known, known to everybody sexual sin that they can have a second chance and start over. I can feel confident in telling people that the real issue in their lives is not their past sin, but their future in God. Jesus says, Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye but fail to recognize the log in your own eye? Drop your stone. You're not perfect. Judgment has done a lot of unnecessary damage in people's lives. And we judge people for all kinds of things. People have been judged for getting a divorce, for having a child out of wedlock, for having too much money, for not having enough money, for being too liberal, for being too conservative, for being a Republican, for being a Democrat, for being too fat or too skinny, for battling depression or some other mental illness, for not having friends, for not having the right kinds of friends. You name it, people have been judged for it. And Jesus says, drop your stone. You're not perfect. One of the hardest things to do in life, I think, is to look in the mirror and to see our own shortcomings, our own character flaws. We all have them, but we're not very good at owning up to them, claiming them, owning them admitting to them. It's much easier to point to what's wrong with everybody else, where they fall short, where they go wrong, how they're different. Because if we can keep focusing on what's wrong with everybody else, then we never have to look in the mirror and figure out the areas that we need to work on. Remember what the tax collector prayed last Sunday in the scripture when he went up to the temple to pray? Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Not a bad prayer. Amen.